Chapter 22. Now the landscape was changing. It was a subtle change, hard to identify at first. The road was narrower and bumpy, apparently no longer intended by road crews. It was harder suddenly to balance on the bike as the front wheel wobbled over stones and ruts. One night, Jonas fell when the bike jolted to a sudden stop against a rock. He grabbed instinctively for Gabriel, and the new child, strapped tightly into his seat, was uninjured, only frightened when the bike fell to his side. But Jonas's ankle was twisted, and his knees were scraped and raw, blood sweeping through his, his torn trousers. Painfully, he righted himself in the bike and reassured Gabe. Tentatively, he began to ride in daylight. He had forgotten the fear of the searchers, who seemed to have diminished into the past. But now there were new fears. The unfamiliar landscape held hidden, unknown perils. Trees became more numerous, and the forests beside the roads were dark and thick with mystery. They saw streams more frequently now and stopped often to drink. Jonas carefully washed his injured knees, wincing as he rubbed at the raw flesh. The constant ache of his swollen ankle was eased when he soaked it occasionally in the cold water that rushed through the roadside gullies. He was newly aware that Gabriel's safety depended entirely upon his own continued strength. They saw their first waterfall, and for the first time, wildlife. Plain, plain, Gabriel called, and Jonas turned swiftly into the trees, though he had not seen planes in days, and he did not hear an aircraft engine now. When he stopped the bicycle in the shrubbery and turned to grab Gabe, he saw the small, chubby arm pointing towards the sky. Terrified, he looked up, but it was not a plane at all. Though he had never seen one before, he identified it from his own fading memories, for the giver had given to him, them him often. It was a bird. Soon there were many birds along the way, soaring overhead, calling. They saw deer, and once, beside the road, looking, his thoughts continued. If he had stayed, he would have starved in other ways. He would have lived a life hungry for feelings, for color, and for love. And for Gabriel, for Gabriel, there would have been no choice at all. No life at all, so there had really been no choice. It became a struggle to ride the bicycle as Jonas weakened from lack of food, and he realized at the same time that he was encountering something that he had for a long time yearned to see, hills. He sprained, his sprained ankle throbbed as he forced the pedal downward in an effort that was almost beyond him, and the weather was changing. It rained for two days. Jonas had never seen rain, though he had experienced it often in the memories. He had liked those rains, enjoyed the new feeling of it, but this was different. He and Gabriel became cold and wet, and it was hard to get dry, even when the sunshine occasionally followed. Gabriel had not cried during the long, frightening journey. Now he did. He cried because he was hungry and cold and terribly weak. Jonas cried too, for the same reasons, and for another reason as well. He wept because he was afraid now that he could not save Gabriel. He no longer cared about himself. Chapter 23. Jonas felt more and more certain that the destination lay ahead of him, very near now in the night that was approaching. None of his senses confirmed it. He saw nothing ahead except the endless ribbon of road unfolding in twisting narrow curves. He heard no sound ahead. Yet he felt it, felt that elsewhere was not far away, but he had little hope that he would be able to reach it. His hope diminished further when the sharp, cold air began to blur and thicken with swirling white. Gabriel, wrapped in his inadequate blanket, was hunched, sh shivering, and silent in his little seat. Jonas stopped the bike warily, lifted the child down, and realized with heartbreak how cold and weak Gabe had become. Standing in the freezen mound that was thickening around his numb feet, Jonas opened his own tunic, held Gabriel to his bare chest, and tied the torn and dirty blanket around them both. Gabriel moved feebly against him and whimpered briefly into the silence that surrounded them. Dimly, from a nearly forgotten per perception as blurred as the substance itself, Jonas recalled what the whiteness was. It's called snow, Gabe, Jonas whispered. Snowflakes. They fall down from the sky, and they're very beautiful. There was no response from the child who had once been so curious and alert. Jonas looked down through the dusk at the little head against his chest. Gabriel's curly hair was matted and filthy. There were tear stains outlined in dirt on his pale cheek, and his eyes were closed. As Jonas watched, a snowflake drifted down and was caught briefly for a moment's sparkle in the tiny, fluttering eyelashes. Warily, he remounted the bicycle. A steep hill loomed ahead. In the best of conditions, the hill would have been a difficult, demanding ride. But now, the rapidly deepening snow obscured the narrow road and made the ride impossible. His front wheel moved forward imperceptibly as he pushed on the pedals with his numb, exhausted legs. But the bicycle stopped. It would not move. He got off and let it drop sideways into the snow. For a moment, he thought about how easy it would be to drop beside it himself, to let himself and Gabriel slide into the softness of snow, the darkness of night, and the warm comfort of sleep. But he had come this far. He must try to go on. 
The memories had fallen behind him now, escaping from his protection and returned to the people of his community. Were there any left at all? Could he hold on to one last bit of warmth? Did he still have the strength to give? Could Gabriel still receive? He pressed his hands into Gabriel's back and tried to remember sunshine. For a moment, it seemed that nothing came to him, that his power was completely gone. Then it flickered suddenly, and he felt tiny tongues of heat begin to creep across and into his frozen feet and legs. He felt his face begin to glow, and the tense, cold skin in his arms and hands relax. For a fleeting second, he felt that he wanted to keep it for himself, to let himself bathe in the sunlight, unburdened by anything or anyone else. But the moment passed and was followed by an urge, a need, and a passionate yearning to share the warmth with the one person left for him to love. Aching from the effort, he forced the memory of warmth into the thin, shivering body in his arms. Gabriel stirred. For a moment, they were both bathed in warmth and renewed strength as they stood hugging each other in the blinding snow. Jonas began to walk uphill. The memory was agonizingly brief. He had trudged no more than a few yards through the night when it was gone and they were cold again. But his mind was alert now. Warming himself ever so briefly had shaken away the, the lethargy and resignation and restored his will to survive. He began to walk faster on feet that he could no longer feel. But the hill was treacherously steep, and was, he was impeded by the snow and his own lack of strength. He didn't make it very, very far before he stumbled and fell forward. On his knees, unable to rise, Jonas tried a second time. His consciousness grasped at the wisp of another warm memory and tried desperately to hold it there, to enlarge it and pass it into Gabriel. His spirits and strength lifted with the momentarily warmth, and he stood again. Gabriel stirred against him as he began to climb, but the memory faded, leaving him colder than before. If only he had time to receive more warmth from the giver before he escaped. Maybe there would be more left from him now, but there was no purpose in if onlys. His entire concentration now had been on moving his feet, warming Gabriel and himself, and going forward. He climbed, stopped, and warmed them both briefly again with a tiny scrap of memory that seemed certainly to be all he had left. The top of the hill seemed so far away, and he did not know what lay beyond, but there was nothing left to do but continue. He trudged upwards. As he approached the summit of the hill at last, something began to happen. He was not warmer. If anything, he felt n more numb and more cold. He was not less exhausted. On the contrary, his steps were leaden, and he could barely move his freezing, tired legs. But he began suddenly to feel happy. He began to recall happy times and remembered his parents and his sister. He remembered his friends, Asher and Fiona, and he remembered the giver. Memories of joy flooded through him suddenly. He reached the place where the hill crested and he could feel the ground under his snow-covered feet become level. It would not be uphill anymore. We're almost there, Gabriel, he whispered, feeling quite certain without knowing why. I remember this place, Gabe. And it was true, but it was not a grasping of a thin and burdensome recollection. This was different. This was something he could keep. It was a memory of his own. He hugged Gabriel and rubbed him briskly, warming him to keep him alive. The wind was bitterly cold. The snow swirled, blurring his vision. But somewhere ahead, through the blinding storm, he knew there was warmth and light. Using his final strength and a special knowledge that was deep inside him, Jonas found the sled that was waiting for them at the top of the hill. Numbly, his hands fumbled for the rope. He settled himself on the sled and hugged Gabe close. The hill was steep, but the snow was powdery and soft, and he knew that this time there would be no ice, no fall, and no pain. Inside his freezing body, his heart surged with hope. They started down. Jonas felt himself losing consciousness and with his whole being willed himself to stay upright atop the sled, clutching Gabriel and keeping him safe. The runners sliced through the snow and the wind whipped at his face as they sped in a straight line through an incision that seemed to lead to the final destination, the place that he had always felt was waiting, the elsewhere that held their future and their past. He forced his eyes open as they went downward, downward sliding, and all at once he could see lights and he recognized them now. He knew that they were shining through the windows of rooms, that they were red and blue and yellow lights that twinkled from trees in places where families created and kept memories, where they celebrated love. Downward, downward, faster and faster, suddenly he was aware with certainty and joy that below and ahead they were waiting for him, and that they were waiting too for the baby. For the first time he had heard something that he knew to be music, and he heard people singing. Behind him, across vast distances of space and time, from the place that he had left, he thought he heard music too, but perhaps that was only an echo.